substantial uh, component of electronic phenotyping, as well as consent and community uh, consultation and uh, uh, focus on data privacy and uh, re-identification risk because these were largely repositories that were community-based. Uh, in the second phase, we then added, as uh, we mentioned, expanded into pediatrics, as well as uh, a large pharmacogenomics component that I'll tell you about. Um, and in implementing that then clinically, we also uh, needed to do a fair amount of work in clinician and patient education and also in uh, clinical decision support. So the, uh, uh, the two phases of eMERGE, the first one, the first four years, really was focusing on how repositories linked to electronic medical records can be used in genomic research. And that uh, included these five components that I told you about a moment ago. Um, in the second phase, we, uh, we recognized we needed to expand into, into the childhood age ranges, which had been a sensitive topic earlier, and, and we've been uh, successful in doing that. Uh, we also added the pharmacogenomics and the clinical implementation. These are the biorepositories involved in the project. You can see the, uh, the sort of bifid uh, uh, pediatric site here, uh, having a total of 105,000 genotype samples uh, down here and about 329,000 electronic medical records. And the question came up earlier where the 3,000 number came from, and it was basically the smallest of, uh, of these uh, uh, biorepositories so that they all basically can contribute to the electronic phenotyping and, and genome-wide studies. Uh, so these are the two pediatric biorepositories I mentioned. And basically building on this um, uh, infrastructure, as mentioned earlier, we can uh, 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 proceed or follow the uh, um, eMERGE three-pronged strategy of discovering clinically relevant variants, uh, assessing the impact of large-scale implementation on the cost and quality of care, and enabling discovery and implement implementation research in other biorepositories. One of the things that we made sure that Emerge did from the beginning was to make its tools and best practices and guidelines available uh, widely to the community so that uh, others could do this kind of work. Uh, this is just a um, suggestion or a, a listing of some of the primary phenotype gene associations that were found in Emerge 1 in response to Tony's question earlier. And you can see uh, the Fox. E1 association with hypothyroidism that I mentioned, but also a number of others that uh, were first reported here. And just to give you a feel for where this fits in our genomic medicine research portfolio, um, these are the, the four components of eMERGE as they were funded over these four years. Uh, the, the original um, program was uh, 26 million, um, and then a year later we added in two, three bio, pediatric biorepositories. Uh, in that same year, we added in a large pharmacogenetics component. Um, and last year, um, the Office of the Director wanted to add a, a substantial component in ethics and consent and saw eMERGE as a, as a very good place to do that. So the total funding for this is, is $45 million um, over the course of, of fiscal 11 to 14, or about $12 million, million a year. Uh, and then the other programs that we have in genomic medicine, I'll talk about it in a little more depth, particularly those that touch very closely on eMERGE, but they're shown here. Um, CSER at about, about the same size now, uh, sorry, at a considerably larger size. ClinGen, our database of uh, um, clinical decision um, uh, or consensus uh, um, information on genetic variants that can be used in clinical care. Uh, Ignite, which is more along the lines of implementing in places that had not previously had any kind of uh, genomic medicine uh, implementation, such as uh, family practice clinics and some of the military settings and that sort of thing. Uh, Insight, our newborn sequencing program, and of course the uh, undiagnosed diseases program. Uh, so back in 2007 when eMERGE began, this is what most medical records rooms in most hospitals and physicians' offices looked like. Um, a lot has changed in that, in that time now. We're looking really at electronic medical records in a very large proportion of these settings. And these are the kinds of, of records that I look at when I, I practice over at Walter Reed or other physicians are, are pulling up um, to, to be able to work with their patients. Lots of information in those. Uh, these are data from the CDC and the um, um, Office of the Health, um, Health Information Technology, uh, the director of that. And, it was estimated in 2008 about 9% of hospitals uh, were achieving standards for health IT incentives versus more than 80% last year. Uh, with physicians, uh, about 17% of physicians uh, were using electronic medical records versus uh, about 50% uh, in 2013. So really tremendous growth there. And the anticipation is that more and more types of data sets will be added to these. This is a somewhat fanciful, fanciful figure from a friend in Denker in Nature Biotech. Uh, suggesting that a medical record could involve lots and lots of different kinds of genomic data sets. And they warn 
that the future primary care physician may need to cope with a staggering array of integrated patient data, including genome sequences and biological networks. So, uh, so a lot of, of opportunity in the electronic medical record area. <clears throat> Some of the needs really that are quite critical in terms of genomic medicine as opposed to other forms of medicine, uh, because genomic data are so vast, uh, sharing them among providers and across time for clinical care is a real challenge. Any of you who've had an MRI uh, know that you, you get your MRI on a disc and you take it to some other radiologist and they may or may not have the software to be able to read it. Um, that is, is going to be compounded uh, dramatically, uh, probably with sequence data and other kinds of uh, uh, genomic data. Uh, updating the findings as knowledge accrues. So obviously, you know, once one finds a, a bony abnormality in the, in the brain, there's not a whole lot that tends to be learned about it. Some things do. Uh, obviously, with the genomics, uh, there's a, a tremendous amount that is learned about these variants as time goes by, and somehow that information needs to be updated, provided to patients and their physicians. Providing clinical decision support, no physician can remember all of the 2,000 sets of guidelines they're supposed to know outside of genomics, and so decision support has been developed to address that, who needs a vaccine, who should have a pap smear, that sort of thing. Um, but th this will be needed um, uh, considerably more, we suspect, in genomics because there won't be that many people and it won't be so obvious as to who has a variant unless you're actually able to query their genome. There's a fair amount of quality improvement research that could be done using this kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, decision support or, or uh, querying the medical records, uh, including reducing incorrect or redundant ordering. Uh, Intermountain Healthcare has some data uh, showing that the same genetic test is being ordered more than once, sometimes very expensive genetic tests, uh, rather than being sure that you can find them and, and um, uh, carry them forward into other, um, for other physicians. And basically implementing what have been called rapid learning healthcare systems, where a system is able to query uh, in a near real time the um, uh, care that is being provided based on a variety of metrics, such as if you have the such and such variant, uh, do you avoid such and such drug as is recommended, or is that even checked, or that sort of thing. Uh, and that allows a rapid feedback that, uh, that can actually improve healthcare in real time. Uh, these were also um, good tools for patient education and self-management, especially to the degree that they involve patient portals and patient accessible uh, uh, software, and potentially for the identification of at-risk family members. Uh, it's, it's unusual in this country to have family members' medical records linked per se, um, where in other countries that is not uncommon. Um, but it is possible through potentially social networking or other kinds of, of approaches to at least alert family members that, uh, that there might be something uh, they should be discussing. So uh, when we were trying to determine, as we often do, uh, what the future of this program should be, we held a workshop, as I mentioned earlier, in January, uh, asking for future directions for this workshop. And we really asked the workshop participants to try to balance this question of, you know, where, where should we be in terms of discovery and implementation? Recognizing that given our, our uh, strategic plan, we sort of felt that, you know, we were shifting emerge into, at least in phase two, more into the implementation space. And so we expected that in phase three it would be more almost entirely perhaps um, shifted into that space. As it turned out, the, the workshop participants very strongly felt that we should continue both discovery and implementation in emerge, as we discussed earlier. Um, and then in some ways the two go hand in hand and, and that uh, it would be silly to try to, to segment them off. Uh, and that we should indeed conduct research on implementation, that that is a place that emerges is really uh, quite well positioned because of its focus on electronic medical records and the fact that those really integrate into a whole variety of different things. So it, we were advised that emerge discovery research, research should leverage the rich um, EMR phenotyping that has been a hallmark of, of emerge and that it, in fact it helped to develop. Uh, we should use state-of-the-art genomic techniques, so they urged us to move away from genotype arrays uh, as, as being earlier technology, and that really uh, sequencing was the way to go, and that's where we, we should focus. Uh, assess phenotypes of rare variant carriers, so when you have 100,000 people or, or more than that, um, you can find folks who have uh, uh, rare variants that are, you know, result in loss of function, and I'll show you some data on that um, uh, from our pharmacogenetic program. Uh, and you also are, are at a, a great advantage when they have uh, agreed to be in studies and to uh, come back for iterative phenotyping that you can bring them back and actually ask, you know, what are the phenotypes associated with those. And then in, in sort of a new twist, we were encouraged to um, uh, in, include an aspect of basically bedside back to bench research, which we have not done well. Um, and our genomic medicine working group is, is recognizing this and kind of urging us in this area uh, that potentially we could um, uh, be 
uh, searching functional databases or even generating functional data, although that may, may be uh, something that we'd probably want to do in collaboration with a variety of other NHGRI resources and leveraging those such as SGTEx or ENCODE, uh, but something that uh, we were encouraged to consider. On the implementation side, we were encouraged to examine rare but collectively common variants, so variants that are grouped either in a gene or in a pathway, et cetera, uh, to inform potential treatment or diagnosis. Um, strongly urged to explore differences in implementation across diverse subgroups. Emerge currently contains uh, uh, some biorepositories that are quite diverse, others that are not so, um, but the mix of them actually gives us a, a reasonable distribution of about 25% uh, African American, uh, which we are happy with but would, would like it to be a little bit higher, particularly in Hispanics. Um, developed and test approaches to reannotation and dissemination of that information and dissemination of those approaches, as we talked about, as knowledge accrues and generate data on efficiency, cost effectiveness, and ease of implementation um, on, on cost of care. And then in terms of the, you know, the, the unique strength, really, of, of, the, of where Emerge comes together on discovery and, and implementation, uh, really this was, was something that um, uh, seemed to fit Emerge better than any of our, our other programs and really is not being filled by any other group, which is to, to take um, recommendations for clinically actionable genes that are now out in the, in the public domain and trying to figure out you know, which of those actually is actionable and which is not because they were identified in, in basically selected people who were at very high risk. When you apply these in unselected people, how often do you come across variants? Well, it turns out very often you've probably seen the papers in, in, um, um, uh, from the exome data and others that, that show a high frequency, 2 to 4% um, of uh, significant variants in those. So that was what we were urged to consider, these uh, variants in the ACMG, and that need not be the only list, and it certainly won't be the only list uh, a year from now when we go forward with this, but they include um, hereditary cancer syndrome, some sudden death syndromes, a variety of other things that are uh, both uncommon and, and quite serious and actionable. And to develop uh, approaches for dealing with them, like this sort of pop-up box, a, 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 an example of clinical decision support that gives an alert uh, that a patient has renal dysfunction, for example, and is being um, uh, prescribed a drug that they probably shouldn't have. Similarly, a pop-up could come up that says, you know, they have a, a, a variant that makes them allergic to abacavir and they shouldn't receive that. And those, that kind of decision support is currently in place for a rare set of genes, but uh, that needs to expand. And then the integrated LC infrastructure that, uh, that began with the, the phase one of eMERGE and continued in phase two should look at local differences across IRBs in uh, genomic expertise, promote IRB education. One of the challenges that we've had in implementation in phase two of eMERGE is that institutions approach this very, very differently. And some are, are um, uh, willing to be very broad in terms of what is implemented and others are, are quite concerned about either the medical legal imp um, um, implications of that or um, uh, other things, concerns in their population. So that's an area we uh, were encouraged to continue to work on. Also uh, continuing to work on risks of re-identification, uh, talking to patients on what kinds of information they would like to have in their records and how it should be displayed. Um, and then looking long term, and long term will vary obviously for this program, it would be the, over the four year period of the grant, what happens after returning results such as potentially behavior change, change in medications, other kinds of things. I thought it would be worth just commenting on the fact that, that defining phenotypes from electronic medical record data is not simply extracting IC diagnosis codes. These are, are very extensive and involved algorithms. Um, and I'll, I'll go into a little more detail on some of our findings um, a little bit later. Uh, but there has been a really strong replication of genotype phenotype associations based on the medical record, looking at um, associations previously published in other genome wide association studies. And then that's actually been sort of turned on its head in the phenome-wide association study where one variant or strong variant has been um, then looked at in a, uh, a variety of, of medical record phenotypes um, to determine what else it's associated with and could those be hints then in terms of, of other diseases or other functional pathways. Uh, in addition, this, this paper in Nature Biotechnology in 2013 um, showed a systematic comparison of, of looking at both phenome-wide association study and, uh, data and genome-wide association data, um, coming up with, with basically comparing the hundreds by hundreds matrix and identifying a number of new associations that I can show you a little bit later. Um, and this one interesting approach on mechanistic phenotypes that was looking specifically at uh, if one looks outside of uh, electronic medical record phenotypes into other ontologies and other functional uh, kinds of annotations of genes that have been associated with various phenotypes, uh, what hints could you get in terms of, of disease uh, mechanisms? 
And this is just to give you a hint on, on what some of these algorithms look like. Many of them go on for pages and pages of code. So they're, and they are iteratively developed. They're then validated against a, um, a clinician's diagnosis. And then there's a, a back and forth across multiple sites. One of the unique things about these is that they actually are designed to be transportable across uh, different medical record systems. And this is just the, uh, the phenotype workflow. I won't go into it in a great deal other than to say that there's uh, both creation, validation, and sharing of these. Uh, these are the various tools that are used uh, in doing so and then publication. of. <coughs> and this just gives you an idea of uh, one very powerful way that one can use longitudinal data. Shown here are data from 25,000 African Americans uh, for up to 16 years. And this is estimated glomerular filtration rate, which is a measure, probably the best measure, most commonly used measure of, of renal function. Um, and what you see is the, uh, the level below which uh, one is, is viewed as being abnormal or having chronic kidney disease and then the normal range. What uh, Erwin Bottinger and his group at Mount Sinai did um, was to basically take these data and cluster them. And they, they came up with nine clusters. I'm only showing you four of them here. But they were clustered using the same kinds of algorithms that we use for genotyping data or sequencing data, et cetera, um, and found four you know, main groups that they then related to um, numbers of risk alleles and uh, oops, uh, and other diseases. There we go. So and then the uh, uh, physician diagnosed chronic kidney disease and acute myocardial infarction as a complication of renal disease. And as you can see, um, this the group of normals here tends to be normal on these and have low risk of complicating diseases. A, a group that could be identified as rapidly progressive with chronic kidney disease had much higher uh, rates of ApoL1 as did kidney transplantation patients, as did end-stage kidney disease. So this is just an example of what can be done with longi longitudinal phenotypes um, in these kinds of programs. And these are tools that eMERGE has developed and made available. This, uh, the CKB includes the phenotyping algorithms and um, instructions for use, and also encourages deposition of others' phenotyping algorithms uh, in, into it for, uh, for further sharing. This phenotype harmonization tool actually allows mapping across multiple uh, ontology so that um, uh, other uh, investigators in other kinds of fields, the NCI thesaurus, for example, is there, the SNOMED CT, et cetera. So it doesn't have to be a phener, um, sorry, an eMERGE phenotype in order to be useful. And there's been a, a large effort on uh, physician patient education. This myresults.org uh, portal, which is designed mainly for patients but also used by physicians, patients can click on the, the your results. Um, and get actually a, a little bit of a tutorial in, um, in this kind of work, as well as, um, as well as other resources, recommended websites, and, and actually some um, nice instructional videos that were developed by the eMERGE investigators. And, and that, the number of those is growing. And then these are our papers that have been published on um, uh, consent, privacy, and stakeholder concerns from the consent community consultation uh, group, as well as the, now the, the consent and regulatory concerns group. Uh, one of the, the seminal ones was actually this Glad You Asked paper, um, participants' opinions of reconsent on, on data deposition into dbGaP. So early on with dbGaP, we made the assumption that if people didn't mind that we were using their data, that, uh, that it was OK and we didn't have to really uh, consent them. And what they did was to go back and ask. Um, and basically, almost all participants said, sure, you know, I'm, I'm happy for my data to be used in this way. However, I really want you to ask me before you do that. Um, there have been, has been work on anonymization. Returning results, it was actually a, a joint paper uh, between, oops, it's touchy, between um, eMERGE and the, the, um, the CSER uh, actionable results uh, uh, group, uh, and work on stakeholder engagement, trying to look at, at other groups that might be involved in, in this as well. Uh, these are the site-specific genomic medicine implementation pilots. So we asked the, the groups to propose when they came in for eMERGE phase two what kinds of implementation pilots they would do. They were pilots because they needed to be relatively small to put together all of the, the um, added infrastructure that's needed for doing this, for, for consenting people, for um, uh, cons counseling them on their results, and, and following those up, and educating, et cetera. So those are those programs. But what I really wanted to do was to give you a, a feel for the uh, Emerge PGX project. Um, we've talked with you about this briefly as well, the Pharmacogenomics Research Network. Uh, provided to us an array, a state-of-the-art um, pharmacogenetics array, uh, as well as a, a number of other uh, areas of expertise. And then eMERGE provided sort of uh, a large population, less focused um, pharmacogenetic labs and, uh, and the electronic phenotyping, as well as work in the, in the privacy concerns. The idea was to deploy this um, particular array 
of 84 known pharmacogenes, recruit patients and, and obtain uh, the data, then selectively implement genotypes in the electronic medical record as the institutions became comfortable with doing that and they could be convinced to do it, um, and then to develop a repository, the Sphinx repository for these data that the PGRN group could then go back and, and analyze. So there were 84 VIP genes as, as they were named. Um, they were sequenced with all of the coding sequence plus an embolism capture of the, the um, introns so that you could get the splice sites plus uh, CYP2D6 which is, uh, uh, metabolizes up to 25% of, of uh, uh, prescribed genes was um, uh, captured in its entirely with the introns. Um, and there's upstream and downstream sequence, some probes for intron non-coding non sites. The average read depth as we were talking about earlier is, is uh, higher, it's about four, nine, almost 500. Uh, X for this kind of an array, and it's highly concordant with uh, uh, existing HapMap data. And then based on the implementation was based on a series of guidelines uh, published by the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium, or CPIC. Um, there are many, many, of, many more of these even than, than shown here, uh, but the, the ones that were sort of picked initially were the widely recognized and accepted uh, clopidogrel, simvastatin, and warfarin in mainly the, P the adult sites, as you can see, because uh, that's where they tend to be used. Sorry. Um, and then the um, uh, pediatric sites used a smaller version or some that were uh, unique to, to pediatrics, as you can see here. And our hope is that as each of them implements these, develops the education material, the clinical decision support, et cetera, that they share it with each other, and that is happening. So other sites are, are bringing other drugs online. And eventually, we hope that they will all at least uh, ho hopefully be doing more than they're currently doing. I wanted to share some, some initial results on this um, from the first 2,000 patients that have been sequenced in eMERGE PGX, uh, two genes that are associated with sudden death, and so were of uh, considerable um, uh, concern in, in both the, the, among the eMERGE investigators as well potentially their clinicians and patients. There were 83 rare, that is a minor allele frequency less than 1%. Uh, variants identified in SCN5A, a potassium channel gene, and 45 in KCNH2 is not unexpected. The one gene is about twice as big as the other. Um, 121 of those had a, a minor allele frequency of, of less than 0.5%, and actually 92 of them were singletons. Three labs were then asked to assess their known or likely uh, pathogenicity, and one lab uh, uh, called of the 128, 16 of them as being known or likely pathogenic. A second lab, a little bit higher um, yield, 24 out of 128. The third lab back down a little bit closer to lab number one. But what was most worrisome, of course, was that only, f only four were called by all three uh, labs in the same way. So, um, so what we did then was to take um, the 40 variants that at least one lab had called as being uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic. 48 people were carrying those variants, and their electronic medical records were reviewed. Five of them had uh, cardiac conduction defects that are quite common in the population and are not really strongly known to be associated with uh, uh, defects in this gene, but they may well be. Um, none of them had a history of what's called long QT syndrome, which is what these genes uh, are named for or are associated with, or of cardiac arrest. No family history of cardiac arrest. But really the best phenotype here is the QT uh, interval, as shown here. It's prolonged in people uh, who have these syndromes, Romano Ward syndrome and Brigada syndrome specifically. Um, and of those, these 48 people, only one of them had one measured uh, QT interval that was abnormal, uh, and that was during a, a time when she was metabolically abnormal, and that could have prolonged her QT. Um, interestingly, the, the variant in this patient was annotated by the three labs. One of them called it pathogenic, one called it benign, and one called it unknown significance. So you can see the problem that we're facing when in finding these, and I think the experience in CSER and other programs that are beginning to do sequencing are, are coming up in the same way. Another challenge with this is that 12 of these 48 people had no electronic, no Q EKG in their electronic medical record, and they weren't all children. Should they be called back um, to, to have their, their EKGs run? Uh, these are important questions. So the clinical impl implementa implications of sequence variants, variation are, are really quite vast, um, and variants with presumed detrimental impact on gene function are often found. Um, the phenotypic and clinical implications of these in people who are unselected for disease or positive family history are largely unknown. The burden of reporting these, there's about 2% in two genes for 2,000 people um, in this first pass in, in eMERGE. So when one gets up to 56 genes, nearly everybody is going to have something if you don't have some way of culling those down. Uh, and so reliable information is really needed on the phenotypic manifestations. And you need large numbers of people to do that because these variants are rare. 
Um, and it, it is also clear that if you know you have a variant and it's a, it's a heavily loaded family, that, is, that certainly helps to point you in the direction that it might be pathogenic. So um, getting then to what we're proposing in phase three, uh, we want to continue the genomic medicine discovery and implementation research using large biorepositories with electronic medical records to identify rare variants with presumed impact, uh, significant impact on function, that's loss of function variants, in what we estimate to be about 100 clinically relevant genes. Um, there are 56 on, in one group's list currently. Others, uh, Jim has a longer list. Um, University of Washington has a slightly longer list, et cetera. And this will evolve over time, but we're thinking about 100 seems to be a reasonable number. Assess their phenotypic implications, and then with appropriate consent and education, uh, report what actionable variants there are, and there will be debate and decision making about that to patients, potentially to their families, and that's a researchable question as to how one goes about doing that, uh, and their clinicians. And then also assess the impact to patients, clinicians, and institutions. Uh, the EMERGE 3 would continue previous aims of EMERGE, including expanding and enhancing electronic phenotyping, providing clinical decision support, um, integrating genomic findings into the medical records for, for ongoing clinical care and research, engaging and educating IRBs or health system leaders, as well as EMR vendors. EM, um, uh, EMERGE is well positioned to have sort of a collective voice to get EMR vendors to really engage in genomics. They have not so far, even though there have been a lot of promises made about implementing family history or implementing uh, some candidate gene information, and disseminating methods, tools, and best practices. And the proposed scope is described in the concept as 8 to 12 clinical sites, plus a coordinating center, plus uh, genome sequencing. And we said, and genotyping facilities. We don't anticipate a huge amount of genotyping being done, but it's, you know, we want to have the capability, and we don't think that would be a problem for anybody that can do sequencing. We propose two to 3,000 DNA samples per site that would be sequenced for 100 target genes um, in, within a CLIA environment, so that requires a lot of sample tracking and consent and validation, et cetera. Um, and we anticipate that, uh, that the protocol would be sort of laid down in the first year with uh, review by our external scientific panel and could, ex uh, could evolve as the technology evolves. Um, we'd also want to explore potential bedside to bench functional assessments, leveraging uh, existing uh, data resources and perhaps uh, generating others. And then also to expand the phenotyping library, we'd actually propose to, to double it. And in uh, reviewing with uh, council reviewers, they suggested that might be a little bit too um, ambitious, and so maybe in the 60 to 80 range. Okay. Um, and then the criteria for site selection, again, listed there include population diversity. Uh, availability of high-quality GWAS data, and, and that is one that we'll discuss, obviously. Availability of patients for CLIA sequencing and return of results. Completeness of the EMR data in the, the um, uh, biorepository that's being proposed. And the ability to implement existing eMERGE phenotypes. Um, and then also a broad range of, of disciplines and expertise. Um, it was, we were encouraged to sort of look at new applicants uh, who might have more strengths in population diversity or key expertise. Uh, key areas of expertise, while smaller ones may not be able to, to um, um, implement everything that's needed in eMERGE in order to be able to, to participate very actively so they could conceivably um, partner with other sites as has been done um, in phase two, and then continue to, to uh, evaluate existing sites on their ongoing productivity and their, their collaboration in eMERGE two. So just to come back then to this question very briefly on, on how this all fits. Um, we have really a sort of a spectrum of genomic medicine implementations. We talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, the, there, you can look at this on kind of two axes, a depth of patient characterization versus a breadth of implementation. And those are in dynamic tension. It's hard to do both of them um, uh, to the max, and so we need probably a mix of programs to do this. Um, the Undiagnosed Diseases Program and the NSITE, the Newborn Sequencing Program, both are, are using uh, wide, wide scale sequencing as well as uh, uh, very uh, in-depth patient characterization. In the UDN, the patients are admitted for a week, and so there's a lot of phenotyping that goes on with them. CSER is perhaps a little bit less uh, deep on that, but still uh, very much sort of an, a, a dive into an individual patient. And they're focusing uh, really quite heavily on individual patients, testing multiple models for doing this across different sites. Whereas Emerge and Ignite are on the larger um, scale, they are, are focusing more on evidence generation and system-wide impact, um, as well as dissemination in, in diverse settings. So that's how we see them kind of lining up as a whole, uh, looking at the two programs that Emerge is most closely related to. Uh, you can see the size and, and scope of CSER here. Emerge is much larger, 100,000 patients, 10, uh, also 10 settings. But um, in 
In CSER, there are diverse clinical scenarios that are really quite focused in eMERGE. They, they tend to be much more uh, network-wide phenotypes and uh, shared network-wide phenotyping. Uh, the focus is the individual patient clinical encounter, where here the focus is much more system-wide implementation. In CSER, there's a focus on individual phenotypes versus a broad range of phenotypes. And as the individual patient, sort of on a case-by-case -case basis, and you'll hear more about this from Jim, um, it's much more of a phenotype to genotype, but people have given characteristics. You try to find out the, the genetics that are associated with that. Where in eMERGE, we have the opportunity to take the genotype and look, um, look forward to, uh, to what phenotypes it's associated with. Um, there's exome genome sequencing in CSER. To date, eMERGE has done genotyping and targeted sequencing, and again, that could uh, evolve over time. Uh, CSER is focusing very heavily on, on standardizing sequencing reports as they come from labs so that we don't just get PDFs being put into medical records, but actually something that is computable and usable over the future. Um, eMERGE is more focusing on standardizing the electronic phenotypes. Uh, and then these are areas where they, where they touch and are working together in terms of, of some aspects of medical record implementation, clinical impact, impact pediatrics, and data sharing. And then lastly on IGNITE, um, eMERGE again shown here. IGNITE is, is up in the size range of eMERGE, 50,000 patients, five projects currently. Um, it's in very diverse clinical settings, uh, not expert or leading um, uh, genomics expertise uh, groups. Um, and the focus is really on real world application as opposed to more on the evidence generation and developing approaches that could then be implemented in the real world. Uh, eMERGE tests novel implementation models uh, versus disseminating current implementation models. Uh, there's the GOS genotyping and targeted sequencing mentioned here. IGNITE has actually a very broad range. So some groups are, are doing family history, some are measuring a single variant, some are doing uh, a beginning to do sequencing. Um, developing assessing CDS tools or clinical decision support is a, um, a major focus in eMERGE, whereas in IGNITE it's much more deploying these in diverse settings and then contributing to the evidence base, particularly on the pathogenesis of, uh, sorry, the penetrance of pathogenic variants. Whereas the evidence base in IGNITE will be the effectiveness of implementation methods. So, and then these are the areas in which they touch. So I think I'll stop there and thank the uh, eMERGE investigators and, and particularly Rongling and, and Jackie and, and uh, my staff at Simona and Ken are also working on the pharmacogenomics com component. And and stop there. I can go into David's questions, or maybe we can ask. I think some of these may have been addressed, or he may want to um, uh, have other uh, comments. But perhaps before we do that, uh, it might be best to, to call on council reviewers. So um, Howard chairs the ESP for Emerge. Might be good to start with you, Howard, and then we can kind of go around. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Terry, for that that update. Um, there's a, a couple things you didn't mention that um, because. We've reviewed this fairly recently as the external scientific panel. Um, there, there were 332 publications that have come from this, this network um, across the spectrum of, of uh, areas that you highlighted. So it's been a, uh, a very productive group. Okay. Another thing that, that I don't think came out quite in the slides the way you presented them is that this, this group really, in my mind, more than most, took on what do we really do? It was like applied ELSI. Um, like, what do we actually do? Not what we th do we theoretically do, what might we do, but what do we actually do? And, and the implications of that have been that hospitals and health systems that could care less about research have been able to use that information to make much more objective and reasoned approaches to how they implement genetics. Whether they should implement it or not is a different story, but th they're doing it. Um, and so I think that, that element there, and I'm not a huge LC fan. Um, but I've been really impressed by what's come out of, uh, out of this effort um, because of, of uh, the way it was done. Um, I, you know, the science of implementation seems like an oxymoron. I now understand that it's a real thing, so I appreciate that. Um, the, the discovery part also, uh, you know, you, you had a limited amount of time, but there, there's been some really fundamental discoveries that have been made about mechanism of of disease, not, not just an individual disease, but a class of diseases from an individual organ. So you, you weren't able to show it, but there, the, the, the um, results that hypothyroidism was associated with FOXE1, but that a bunch of other thyroid diseases also came from that same, I guess I should have, uh, uh, you, you anticipated my, my comment. Uh, yeah. um, so the, you know, that discovery is nice, mm -hmm. but then I don't know if you have the phenotype mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so they're basically going into phenom basically by by looking phenom wide. Now there's a lot of thyroid disease that have been implicated to this one. So mm -hmm. there's now a new way of approaching the the entire organ mm -hmm. <laughs> that was not there before emerge started, and that's something that nobody could have done otherwise or didn't, didn't try to do. I guess maybe we should say. 
Um, and so I, I guess um, I, that, that part of it, I think, has been quite exciting. Um, it's, it's still unclear to me exactly uh, where this is going to end up in terms of this balance between research and, and application. And I, I initially thought that was a problem in terms of even having an Emerge 3. But I've come to the conclusion that the fact that I don't know which way it's going to go is why we should have it. Um, because if you look at a lot of other disciplines that have been let to, left to market forces, for want of a better term, um, some of them have done very well. And some of them, we're in a bunch of crap um, because of where things went. Mm -hmm. uh, water flows downward. <laughs> mm -hmm. doesn't go up, you know, most times. Um, and, and so I, I, I am supportive of this because of, um, because of that. And that's not so much a question for you, but uh, mm -hmm. some comments. Okay, great. Oh, thank you. Uh, so maybe we can just go alphabetically. Eric, I think you were, you, you were a reviewer as well. So I'm supportive of the program. And also what I did is I took it upon myself to go to dbGaP and try to understand with Ronglings help what data is being made public. I thought that was an important part. And, and I have to say I was pleasantly surprised about, you know, it's not something that the program, I think, is trumpeted to the community of the data that's being put into dbGaP. So I think it, 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 a tick mark um, in the project's favor is the, uh, the availability of data to the community. So others, not just um, eMERGE investigators, can begin to mine these data and look for the relationships that uh, Howard alluded to. By the way, as Howard, Howard's counsel, I like to say he's highly committed to LC issues in, in research. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he would like to modify, I think, some of the research methods, but he's committed to LC. <laughs> um, I, I think the other point is clearly that this is a direction of the future. So I, I guess I come down on the side of, of the implementation part. I think there are other projects that are doing discovery. But, but where that balance is, you know, let's just let it, let it be what it's going to be and let the data show us over time and not try to second guess. Um, my only concern is, you know, I think as NHGRI, we need to be promoting genomics in science and in practice and in society. And I think limiting it to a select handful of candidate genes I, I don't think is, is forward-looking enough. I know there are cost concerns. I know there are issues about um, returning of results. But I don't think the solution to those issues is to run from it. Right. I think the issues to it is, is, to, is really to push genomics into the project and, and to deal with the, the, the issues. And I, you know, we're all anticipating in the coming, I'll say, year um, continued, you know, continued cost reduction in, in genomes and exomes, and I think uh, Emerge should leverage that and, and really push it into the project. Great. Thank you. Jim? Yeah. Um, the, main thing I I would say, oh, the, the main thing that I would point out, I, I, I think that Emerge has a lot to offer, and where it has the most to offer, I think, is in this, this interface with the electronic medical record. Um, we are seeing, as the slide, two of the slides you showed, a, a tremendous increase in the EMR. That's a huge headache for many of us in, in practice. But in the end, if it is done right, it, there are unprecedented um, opportunities. And Emerge is really, really well positioned to mine the kind of data, the kind of information um, that, that we need to mine. Um, because that information is being collected all the time. The problem is it's being collected in extraordinarily haphazard and sporadic ways in clinical encounters. Um, but with the EMR now, um, and especially if, if uh, vendors are engaged, there are tremendous opportunities for beginning to associate genotypes and phenotypes. And as I'll mention in my talk, I'm getting to some of the, the things that remain a fundamental mystery which is surprising in some ways, um, like penetrance of very well-studied genes. And I think that both Emerge and, as I'll mention, Caesar, are, are, are well positioned to, to answer some of these questions. So, so I, I, to me, I would, I would hit very hard on the, the interface with the medical record. As I'll mention, Eric, I mean, I, I think your point is a good one that we, I, that yes, we need to do whole genome sequencing on lots and lots of people. I think it remains to be seen whether we need to do that in a medical context, um, and I'm not really con convinced of that. In a research context, we do, and I think we have to hit the hit the right right blend. 
Okay. So are you saying Emerge is not a research project? No, no, it is very <laughs> It is very much. But I think we have to figure out where we... That's right, that's right. Um, I think we have to figure out um, where we put resources in the sense of whole genome sequencing and where perhaps there's more bang for the buck in, in uh, uh, more targeted approaches. Especially if you're using them clinically, you want to be sure you've sequenced them. Well, correctly. yeah, 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 that's right. And then we have Shanita and Lucilla. So Shanita, please. So I'll just start by saying if um, Emerge has convinced Howard to have greater respect for LC issues, I'm all behind it, even more so. <laughs> um, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but I would just echo the positive aspects that have been already stated. I, I um, as during sort of our previous conversations, had questions about um, sort of the balance between discovery and implementation, and I think that um, your presentation addressed those very nicely. I would encourage sort of greater focus on implementation because I think that there's a huge amount of information that's been knowledge that's been generated, and I think this group is ideally poised to address um, how you sort of translate that into patient care and sort of understand this, the, the consequences, both positive and negative, of, of that. I think the other thing that's a strength about Emerge is that it's um, the consortium addresses a diversity of, of, issue, of, of clinical issues, medical issues that are rare and sort of those that are more prevalent in the population, and I think that's really a really important um, addition that needs to be continued. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other thing, and as you were talking, one of the things that struck me was you know, a question around how do you resolve, and this seems to be the, the $64 million question. I'm trying to remember that show, but I, I think I've... It was 1000 back then. At that, okay. <laughs> um, you know, but one th an issue that cuts across, I think, all of the, many of the consortium that NHGRI has established is, well, how do you resolve um, the discrepancy between the interpretation of variance across laboratories and to me that's that's you know that's an issue that all of the consortium are facing and and I don't think I've heard any conversation about that and there's a I think that's something important that needs mm -hmm. to be addressed yeah agreed yeah and I, I, I would hope that emerge and Caesar um, will will both be addressing that you heard at the Caesar meetings last week you know a, a tremendous debate and, and discussion about how one goes about doing that. One way to do it is to is to look in the medical records of you know hundreds of people and say how many of them actually you know have the the phenotype the feared phenotype with which this is associated. How many have positive family histories of it? How, you know how many have absolutely nothing? So so that's what that. Yeah, I, I would actually argue that the example you gave kind of may have answered that question for many of those variants, and that is when you look in lots and lots of medical records for variants and you find no hint of a phenotype, it's telling you something, right? So I think the, the negative information can be very can be useful. Yeah. Great. And then Lucille last and then, and then Jill. Right. So the good thing about being last is I don't want to repeat all the good things. <laughs> and I do agree with the uniqueness being in the electronic medical record connection to the genetic findings. I also think um, that perhaps we're underappreciating the difficulty which is to for doing phenotyping by itself because when you say look at the medical records these are clinical notes narrative format that you have to extract the information from so it's not that easy or even with the structured data to find all patients with diabetes type 2 should be a simple click but we know it isn't so all these recipes for phenotyping I think are a great contribution as were the natural language processing items that, that were not mentioned, but I, I know from the publications. So, so I uh, also agree the implementation is critical, and that's why it's at our face in the electronic medical record. So, so it's a great program. Great, great, thank you. Jill? Yeah, so, so I think a, a question that was raised earlier, um, but that didn't get addressed um, here in this um, very comprehensive presentation that you just gave, Terry, is this question again of a hundred or so targeted mm -hmm. genes um, 
versus doing, say, whole exome sequencing. And I probably should have these numbers at my fingertips, but I don't. I'm not sure what exactly is the difference in cost in those in in doing those two different approaches, but it just in it seems to me that we're talking about low penetrance variants in any case, rare variants. And the it it seems even more reasonable that the variant may or may not have a phenotypic effect depending on some other variant. Now, whole genome sequencing at the moment, of course, is much more expensive, but you're going to have to do some kind of hybrid capture or something like that anyway. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wonder if you really want to get the full power to consider, you know, doing the whole, at least the whole exome, maybe if you need to reduce the number of, of centers or something like that. I, I'm not, I'm not sure what the trade-offs are, Terry, mm -hmm. but I, I just think that that's going to be a really important piece here. I mean, environmental things and so on and so forth, maybe you'll get that out of the medical records or not. And I think the point Lucilla raised is absolutely right, that the whole ontological <laughs> NLP issue around these medical records, it could, could kill you, might not, mm -hmm. might not, but... Um, the, the people I know who have done some very interesting work in pharmacovigilance, for example, mm -hmm. have spent huge amounts of their time doing that kind of study of the records themselves and trying to, you know, get them in much better shape for data mining and other things. Yeah. So, no, that, and so you raise a, a couple of, of points. Do you want to address? No, I, I was just going to say. I mean, I, I think you're you're right. The issue is where council and where the NHGRI ultimately comes down on this question of implementation versus discovery. Because if you're you're really talking all about discovery, then it makes abundant sense to, to cast a genome-wide um, net. On the other hand, if you're talking about implementation, there frankly aren't that many genes in the genome that matter to people's health that, that we're aware of. So, so if you're talking about implementation, you can get a whole lot more bang for the buck, I think, by confining yourselves. And I'm, I'm not saying you should do one or the other, but it really does come down to where, where we land on this, this issue of discovery versus implementation. Oh, no. Click, click, that old commercial, they're both right. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, 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 but you, you I, under, I understand what you're choices. saying, but I, but I also say, you know, we, Joe and I probably illicitly were having a little side conversation here, you know, depending on cost, does it make sense not to do this broader coverage and then to bring somebody back to for some, you know, very expensive uh, downstream testing or may, what, even be invasive? I mean, I, I don't know. And, I, and I'm not coming down one way or another because, again, I don't know what the mm -hmm. economics of the situation well, so are I give exactly. You a, a so little, I can shed a little bit of light on that. So it's about a threefold difference based on the targeted genotyping for that we're doing for Emerge PGX, which is 84 genes plus, as I showed you, the introns, and then a couple of genes done um, done completely. So about $600 versus $1,800 today. Obviously, those those costs are going to come down. We're, the whole genome, the, the cost we're having in our other programs, about 4000 or so. We're not talking about whole genome. We're talking about whole exome, you know, uh, whole exome plus. Is and, you're, and you're talking about a, a hundred plus, right? Right. So, so 1,800. But remember, these have to be three in a CLIA environment and validated, and and that's what that more you know, doubles the cost, or even a little bit more than that. Um, I, I, this is a really tough question, uh, and and we, I, I welcome others' thoughts on it. I, I think what we may need to do is to write a solicitation in such a way that we are open to um, a variety of approaches that need to be justified by the investigator. Rudy is nodding. Oh, excellent! I've learned from you, you see. So, so that may be uh, the pro. I think the the other thing, uh, comment, commenting on uh, Lucilla's comment. The discovery aspects of Emerge and the effort put into discovery and Emerge, in large part, are due to the electronic mining. Um, developing these phenotypes, each one of them takes months and months and months, um, and lots of people involved, in, and several iterations across multiple um, uh, medical record systems, so that they're interchangeable. So you can use them in multiple different places, and and those are all you know for preparing for discovery, if you will. But that's the effort that goes into doing the discovery and emerge. Other questions? Getting back to your comment about implementation, 
that those those records and the ontological and natural language processing issues around those records are just as important for implementation as they are for discovery. Right there, but I, I, in my mind, I see it in kind of two phases. That that we do know um, a handful of genes that actually do seem to be important in in clinical medicine, um, and cutting our teeth, which we need to continue to do on those, might make sense. And then as costs drop, casting a wider net. But but again, I. You're right. They're, both of those views are right, but we are going to have to make some hard choices um, because it's a zero-sum game in the end. Right? Okay. I'll step into this moment of silence. Um, we do need a vote for a concept clearance, and I guess um, I'll ask to accept the document that uh, um, Terry made available. I've heard a couple of comments along the lines of giving some flexibility to allow um, the applicants to uh, propose their own balance of discovery versus implementation and in terms of the breadth of sequencing that would be done. done. Are you comfortable allowing that latitude rather than trying to pin that down here? Of course. Yeah. Um, before you go, go there, uh, Terry, you were you had teed up some slides. I think you attributed the questions to David. Uh, a, a series of questions there. Were you going to go over those also? I, I or? can if you. I mean, I'm not uh, trying to yep. cause you trouble, but no, no, on the no. other hand, no, no, no. I, well, it, it, Rudy was telling me I'm, I'm already oh, got way it. over time. Over okay. time. Uh, but, never mind. Um, so, so How about those national. Let's see, yeah, I don't know, David, if we need to go through all of them, um, or maybe you can. Uh, I guess I was assuming that since you posted them, you were going to address them. Sure, sure. Um, and I, I was Rather hoping, than my needing to repeat them. No problem. Right. I, I was hoping that some of them were addressed, so you were going to tell me which ones you were happy with. But in terms of why NHGRI needs to stimulus like this or 10 years from now, if we didn't do it, would anybody notice? I think the, the key question that Emerge can address here is what are the phenotypic impl implications of these rare variants that are being used clinically, that are coming up constantly, and nobody knows how to use them or, or what to report or what to uh, implement on. So, so there's, that is, is kind of the, the you know, overriding issue. In addition, the electronic phenotyping and clinical decision support being done as a network so that it is, is transportable and usable across multiple systems is something that, that isn't being done elsewhere. I guess my, you know, at these, at these um, council meetings, we're constantly, um, the, the trick with considering any given um, concept clearance is, um, I mean, in life we're always considering alternatives. Mm -hmm. The problem is when we, when we debate these, the concept clearance, we take this question in isolation. And so somebody has to speak for the unborn, right? You know, that is what is the, alter the unnamed alternative, right? And, uh, uh, and so I, I think that with every grant or with every concept, we have to ask ourselves um, and, and really rigorously frame the subtraction question, yeah. which is, um, is this, you know, if you really look out across the fullness of time, um, and, and of course we can't know, we don't have crystal balls, but um, is this a space where NHGRI has unique strengths and can make a truly unique contribution that is unlikely to be substantially filled by other parties. And uh, we, we, in earlier today, I think there was at least some acknowledgement around the table that there is um, a good bit of activity in related spaces, maybe not exactly in this space, but in related spaces with large private investments. Um, we talk, I mean, if it's appropriate to talk about that when we talk about DNA sequencing technology, surely it is appropriate to talk about it in this context. And so I'd be, uh, I, w I would say that from my point of view, it's not obvious that NHGRI has a unique uh, compelling contribution to make in this space. So I'd love to hear <laughs> some debate on that, on that question. I don't think it's a trivial question. I think mm -hmm. it's uh, because, of course, by committing a large uh, body of funds in this direction, we are uh, implicitly, not explicitly, but implicitly directing 
uh, away from, from other, other things that NHGRI might fund. But Dave, I mean, one question I'd have is if, how fair is it to ask the question, what has the eMERGE effort to date brought us? And if, would, would, was there a similar amount of similar work being generated with non-ENCODE funds in the same area? And I think the overwhelming, now obviously you don't know what the next five years will be, you can only say what the last five, but there's been an overwhelmingly productive uh, amount of publications and major advances by ENCODE funded work, and I'm not sure that's even being matched by non-ENCODE, I mean, uh, EMERGE, EMERGE funded work, and I don't have been matched in any way by non-EMERGE funded work in that area. So is one yardstick to do this is to look back a little? I mean, I think it's pretty impressive. So. Uh, maybe one way to answer that question is if the private efforts are working on how this relates to their institution, how translatable is that across the many other hospitals that don't have the resources to do that, emerge if it's successful, and I think it's on the way to that, should provide that translation, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. That, that's the expectation, yeah. So, Rudy, you said, I forget if it was Rudy or Terry, you said something about, you know, um, a allowing more latitude in terms of whether an applicant said they were going to stick to this hundred specific list of genes or whether they were going to do whole exome sequencing. Obviously, that would affect the size of their proposals. And so doesn't that mean that you're also going to have to give some latitude in terms of the size of proposals, which will then affect the number of centers you'll be able to award and so on. You know, these things are not independent. And I just want to make sure that if we're really saying, yes, you know, there's latitude about what approach you're going to use in terms of are you going to do whole exome, are you going to do 100 targeted genes, yes, that will be peer reviewed, but then the whole exome might need X amount of money to get the same power, the 100 genes might need. I mean, I, I, I'm just trying to understand, I tend to be very practical, how this is going to work in, a, in terms of the whole program in a, from a practical point of view, or are, are we really saying, no, you're going to, if you, if you do a whole exome, then you have to do many less patients, or you have to do this, or you have to do that. I just want to understand. So I was, I don't have those answers for you, Jill. Uh, I'm not sure that we can have them in a week. Um, I was responding to something Eric said. This is how you drive a field forward. You put a challenge out there, and some are going to send in very safe applications, narrowly focused on 60, 70 genes, and other people are going to find more creative or more effective or more efficient ways to do things, which will put their application a little bit at risk in terms of the peer review, and then we'll be back to council for your guidance when it comes time for a funding plan. That's what I was envisioning here. Jim, did you want to comment? Just ask a, a simple question. Did, did the patient consent um, preclude going back to samples you collected to These would, would almost certainly, sequence? yeah, they would almost certainly need to be reconsented for this, this kind of work. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but, but to address Jill's question, Jill, to have a sort of a level playing field, and we, we need to be careful not to be writing the RFA in, in this in council? No, I understand, oh, but, yeah. but, but we need to have a sense of what, how that it, RFA is going to yeah, play I, out to approve or not approve the sure. concept claim. So, so one way to think about it is that just as an investigator needs to make tough choices on cost and, and scope, so does the institute, so does the broader world. And, and it seems as though um, somebody who's proposing to do a much broader exome or, or genome project is going to have to focus, you know, they're going to have to compensate by having fewer patients and then make the case that they are actually doing something that is useful in clinical implementation as well as in discovery. Um, what we would anticipate is at the end of the day, everybody would do the same thing unless there's a really good reason for it to be done differently. Because as we find in, in Emerge, it's really the power of having the large numbers that's, that's the strength. So CSER is a program that is really focused on multiple different models. Let's try this different ways, different sizes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in Emerge, it tends to be much more of a network-wide, system-wide approach. Back to these questions, okay. Um, so the, the uh, question about requiring existing GWAS data, and, and again, this is something that we're struggling with and, and would welcome your, your advice. 
um, when we invite other groups to participate in Emerge who are not funded as part of Emerge, we expect them to participate by contributing data and being involved in the various discovery aspects and also taking Emerge phenotypes and applying it to their data. Well, the only way you can really tell if they work is if they get similar kinds of associations. So that's the reason for having that. Um, you know, we could conceivably make the numbers less or, or whatever, but we'd welcome your input on, on whether to keep that. I would suggest uh, decreasing the numbers at least, because if you to have more proposals by different institutions in addressing perhaps some um, phenotypes that are less common, mm -hmm. you would need to um, decrease the numbers. Although, although your power really is going to drop off if you're trying to validate a phenotype in an existing, in an mm -hmm. existing, so so we can't get too small. But but maybe we right. can play with mm -hmm. the number a bit. Yeah, how I, I would maybe rephrase that to uh, make it clear what you want. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody has uh, 10,000 CLIA level whole exomes worth of patients, right. and they think, oh, I don't have GWAS data, though. It's whole exome data. Oh, well, mm -hmm. I guess I won't apply. Mm -hmm. um, you know I mean? It, nobody would do that. But yeah. Yeah. you, you okay. just cause be clear what you want. Because yeah. you don't want GWAS. You right. want data on which to make discovery and do implementations. So. Oh, that's that's a great idea. Okay, Sh should there be some floor, or just you make the case, you you investigator? I, yeah. I can't imagine making a solid case for small numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, how does one do that? So, nor can I justify three thousand as a magic number. So, right, I, but you know, people are going to call and they'll they'll call my colleagues and say, I have eight hundred and seventy three. Is that enough? And Say no. We could. We could <laughs> <laughs> they they need the power calculator. Yeah, I mean, you know. I mean, okay. Uh, we we can throw it on peer review. That would be that'd be fine. All right. Okay. Um, let's see. Significant achievements. We have done the best job we could in describing what those were. I have other slides that describe others, and and I might note that we have external scientific panels for all of these programs. Uh, Howard shares the one for Emerge. They look over the productivity, the papers that are coming out. They suggest directions that they should go in. Um, they've been reasonably happy with Emerge so far, uh, even though El uh, Howard doesn't like LC. No, he likes it. So anyway, um, it, one of the interesting things about Emerge is that, is that the LC component is really integrated throughout. It's not sort of a separate thing. We insisted from the beginning that this all be part and parcel of the work that's being done, and I think that's been you know, one approach that we found successful in this program. Okay. Uh, distinguishing feature is breadth, um, and again, you know, yes, yes, that's right. How to judge the success or failure? I think one of the reasons that we have broad programs is that we are trying to make them applicable and relevant to lots of different places, and so we expect them to disseminate, disseminate their their tools, their approaches, and and to those that will be you know taken up and used. So the PKB is being used quite a bit, as is LMAP. Um, the Emerge Consent Form, I believe, is also widely used, um, and and the uh, uh, some of the results. Uh, the myresults.org, et cetera, just started, so we can't really judge them. And then, hey, Terry, uh, yes. but, um, one of the things, because this has come up multiple times, not just mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. um, I think having, it, it may be worth putting in the, uh, the, the document somewhere that the group should define what the metrics are for success, mm -hmm. um, because it, it is hard, but it's, it's not impossible. I mean, sure. you could define it, and it could be that by defining what metrics you care about, it makes it clear what your application is really trying mm -hmm. to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that the group, certainly in, in, the, in the past two phases, the group has had to define milestones, and when they didn't meet them, the ESP came down hard, in mm -hmm. both financially and verbally, mm -hmm. um, and then other times they, they met them, cleared them quite, quite nicely. So mm -hmm. um, I do think having, you know, there's an opportunity again for the, sure. for the marketplace to decide what the metrics are, or at least contribute to that mm -hmm. discussion. Good point. Okay. Um, if I so I think my, the reason I raised that question was, in a sense, when I when I read the the concept clearance document, it is, um, I mean, the the goals of um, of emerge one, two, and three are very lofty, they're very broad, they're very ambitious, and in some sense, I, um, I'm, I'm trying to 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 ask the question, let's say. We go forward with this, and four or five years from now, when one looks back upon what will have been by then, it's already seven years in the making, right? We're already seven mm -hmm. years into Emerge. I mean, if we're, you know, after 12 years of Emerge, um, 
how are we going to know? How are we going to know that this actually made a difference? Um, and in what of the many domains that are touched upon, will uh, it be easiest to point to the success or assess the failure of the program? Um, I believe, uh, I do not believe that the number of publications is an at all useful measure of the, I mean, if you give people money, they're going to publish papers, and those papers are going to attract citations. Um, so I, I don't think that's, for me, that's actually the opposite of an answer <laughs> to the question of how we'll judge the value of a program. Uh, and so I, and, and also it's a way of, I think, um, as Howard was suggesting, of focusing the mind. Um, right. As we talk about it as a concept clearance now is, you know, if it goes forward in thinking about how applicants think about it, as we would talk about this with other other groups of, of scientists and physicians, um, you know, I, I'm almost looking for what's that, <laughs> uh, how will we know that in the fullness of time that this thing has really succeeded? One of the measures, and I agree with you, uh, publications aren't the uh, the only yardstick, of course, it's better than the opposite. If, it, if the consortium has all this money and they're not publishing at all, I might be a little suspicious. One of, one of the things, and again, it's totally anecdotal, but maybe a lot of things, is how much is um, uh, a consortium like Emerge being discussed in other venues and other contexts by other people, including outside the genomics community. And anecdotally, I hear about this all the time. I mean, it was interesting. Terry went over very quickly, but all of a sudden, you know, officer director wanted to do a study, needed to do it, this bioethics study, and you know, we weren't campaigning for more money. In fact, I'm not even sure we wanted no. it. <laughs> We're happy you know, to that have kind it. of thing. All of a sudden, this became the venue for doing something that was needed to be done. Uh, discussions just around genomics, uh, you know, the implementation of electronic health records. And I mean, it just seems like lots of people who have no vested interest are bringing this up. That it's contributing. That it's the go-to place for some of these questions and for some of these, and certainly for the expertise. It's not. It's just and then yet another measure, and it's anecdotal. But I hear it all the time. Of it being relevant, uh, that emerge is is a relevant part of the conversation for some hard problems around implementing genomics in medical care. Uh, may I suggest uh, also if there could be a baseline of how many institutions currently have clinical decision support on genomic data, mm -hmm. and how will be in four years from now? That that would be a measure uh, that perspective we can get. And it's just like there were eight percent institutions mm -hmm. with electronic health records, that there are not 80. So if you find the same thing, sure. there were 4 percent and now there's 40, it, it's probably mm -hmm. uh, so at least an objective measure of uh, how the, the field in general is doing. Might not have been uh, because of eMERGE, but uh, you can probably trace some of those aspects mm -hmm. back to it. Okay. In a sense, it's actually quite related to the my last question, mm -hmm. which is at least in the language of the concept clearance as we saw it, the goals were framed in terms of health impacts, which I interpret to mean health health outcomes mm -hmm. for individuals, and cost effectiveness. And um, so that's, I'm not hearing that um, in this, in, <laughs> in the answer to the last question, I'm not hearing any of that as part of the metric by which the success or failure of this program will be judged. So I don't know whether that's, whether that, whether those words in the description of the concept clearance, whether there's meat on those bones or whether. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think, well, go, go I, I was just going to say, you know, some of this conversation might bleed over into a post-Caesar conversation, too, because because I actually have several slides on outcomes, et cetera. And, you know, one of the things I think council will need to do that's really hard is to figure out how these different efforts mesh. And so I'm just throwing that out there um, that maybe there'll be an opportunity to discuss the same issue in a few well, minutes. And, no, I, I think that's, that's right. In, in addition, I think, you know, a lot of this is in the hypothetical, David. We're just, you know, beginning in some ways to, to find, you have sequence variation. So we have these 44 or 48 people or so. Um, all of them have this vari these variants that at least one lab thinks are important. 
do they keel over dead? Did anybody in their family keel over dead? Do they have the phenotype when we, you know, if we stress them a bit, give them drugs that prolong the QT, do they respond in that way? Now, all of those are health impact. What's the cost effectiveness of actually investigating those people? If you present, prevent one death, is that a good thing, a bad thing, et cetera? What's the cost of doing this kind of testing? What's involved in implementing it in the medical record? Those are the kinds of things that we would do with these actionable variants that would get at that health impact. Well, and changes in medical decisions and adherence to guidelines, those kinds of outcome endpoints are attainable. Um, number of babies cured is probably not. Not. Or, not, or at least it'll be a difficult for, number to come by. For instance, in this, in this particular case, if I could just comment, the one that I, that I described for you, it turned out that that patient had had a long QT. Her clinician had not been aware of it. And when made aware of it because of this genetic finding set, you know, I probably should watch what I prescribe this person. Now, probably they should have been doing that anyway, but that's something that probably is changing her care. So, uh, Although, just on that point, didn't she say they had a metabolic derangement? At the time. Yeah, so at, I, yeah, but, I'm not so sure about that conclusion, but anyway. Well, well but, you know, at least yeah. watch. Let's watch what I prescribe. Yeah, yeah. What, what I just wanted to say was, mm -hmm. I, you know, David's point is a really, really good one. And at the end of the day, it's about outcomes, and it might be worth, um, and, and it's really true, and it's something I hadn't really picked up in going over that. It might be worth mentioning that in the RFA, right? That if people have facile ways of, of beginning to look at oh, outcomes, absolutely. that's, I mean, because that is really the only thing that matters mm -hmm. in the end. Right, and, and I would say that in the Emerge PGX program, uh, our, our ESP has looked at you know, process outcomes as well as, as you know, sort of health outcomes or clinical behavior outcomes, those kinds of things. And so those are definable and, and can be included. Other questions or comments? I mean, I think we've had a good, healthy discussion about this uh, concept. So I think it's time for a vote. Um, can I have a show of hands of those who are uh, approving the concept? If you would like to suggest a caveat, I would. Well, I had started us down that path, but I'm not sure that uh, I captured it sufficiently. I was saying that the, the RFA would be more open to, well, as, as this concept is stated, the, the, the idea of whole exome or whole genome sequencing isn't there. But um, we would. No, I'm sorry, it is. I mean, it, it says targeted exome or genome. OK. You know, and, right. th and that would be decided you know, closer in time based on a variety of factors. OK. So maybe an amendment is not necessary then. It says whether targeted exome or genome. But that's not, so that's saying the target can be just the exome or the exome. Targeted and comma? Exome. Correct. Ta I'm sorry. Targeted comma, okay. exome comma, genome, parentheses. Is this that <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she eats, shoots, eats, eats, shoots, and leaves. Yeah. 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 We're not voting on that yeah. today. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. So perhaps no amendment is necessary, then it is built in. Yeah. Okay. Very, make sure the commas are there. We got that. So let's try the vote again. Those in favor? Any opposed? So noted. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Any abstaining? Thank you, Jill. And thank you, Terry. Sure. All right. Jim, we're going to try to sneak you in here. <laughs> 